Hey, hey, Andy Neary here. Before we dive into today's podcast episode, think back to how you came upon this podcast. Maybe it was through a post, a share, or one of your own peers shared this podcast with you. I don't take any ads. I don't take any sponsorships. The only way this podcast grows is through word of mouth. So if you would be so kind to share this with a peer, with a teammate, with a friend, a family member, I would be forever grateful to you. This is how we impact more business professionals, and this is how this podcast grows. All right, let's dive into today's episode. Hey, hey, welcome back to the Bullpen Sessions podcast. My name is Andy Neary, and this is episode 275. Today, I'm excited to have Hayden Partain join me. Hayden is a former professional soccer player turned employee benefit advisor. Today, he is advising companies in the Dallas-Fort Worth market as a consultant for McGriff. But in this episode, we talk about Hayden's very successful soccer career as he rose the ranks in high school soccer in Dallas, Fort Worth, and ultimately on to Wake Forest University, where he found himself playing in the NCAA championship his senior season and turned that season into uh, success at the professional level, playing soccer for the Sacramento Republic and the United Soccer League. But I wanted to have Hayden on today because Hayden has had some very quick success in the insurance industry. He's only been uh, with McGriff for a little over 13 months, and I thought he could bring such a good perspective to our listeners about what it is like to get in the industry today, what drove him to get in the industry, and what lessons he's learned early early in his career and what lessons he applied in soccer that are helping him have success today in insurance. So whether you're new to the industry or you've been going at it for 25 years, I guarantee Hayden's words of wisdom today are going to help you out. If nothing more, re-spark a flame in you to get back out and get after it. So I'm excited to bring Hayden to you with no further ado. Here's my interview with Hayden Partain. Hayden Partain, welcome to the bullpen sessions podcast. How are you today, my friend? Good. How are you? I am good, man. I'm excited to have you on because, um, we tried this, I think it was in November and had some technical difficulties. So we're back at it now, uh, recording again here early in 2024, but I really wanted to have you on because you've been, been in the insurance industry for a short period of time and Mm -hmm. you've had some success in a short period of time, which is awesome. And I, when we look at our viewers, that, that tune into this every single week. We definitely see people who are newer to the industry looking for some help, but I think your advice is going to be good even for the veterans out there because it is always, I think it's always a good idea to get the perspective of somebody who's newer at the newer in the industry because they may come at it mm-hmm. from a totally different angle that creates an epiphany you weren't aware of because even as a veteran, you kind of get yeah. stuck doing what you've always done. And it's good to get new perspectives sometimes. So I'm excited to share share your story. So let's just kick it off right away. Born and raised in Dallas, we're going to talk about your soccer career. And you've had a very, very prolific soccer career. But talk to me about your upbringing in Dallas in the world of soccer, because, you know, we talk about genes and, and the blessing you have sometimes of, of who you were raised by. And you were raised in a soccer family. I mean, your dad played at UCLA in the Centenary, and he also played professionally in Europe. And mom played at Texas Christian University. So what was it like? I assume you were raised in a household that really preached the love of soccer. Yeah, no, that was that's exactly right. I think i I don't remember a time where I didn't have a ball at my feet. So I think it was once I was walking, they, they put a ball there, you know, and the cool thing was, is that they didn't ever push it, you know? So it was all, I was always around it, but I always loved it. And so my career was all from me wanting to, to play, um, not just them, but with two parents, like I had, you know, I had unbelievable resources, people to lean on to communicate and then networks from that, you know, to continue to be successful into my college and and after college. What was it like playing soccer in Dallas? Um, Because obviously everybody thinks of high school football in Texas. Mm -hmm. I got to believe in Dallas, Fort Worth, the soccer competition is equally as strong. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a hub um, for sure. I mean, I'd, I'd say 
Florida, Texas, and California are like three main hubs where great players come from. So yeah, the competition is high. Um, I kind of was in the realm of where the soccer system was was developing so i played club in high school like my freshman year and um that was hard i I think i played almost 100 games that year um my high school team we fortunately actually ended up winning state so it was cool i got newcomer of the year all those things um uh but then after that they changed if you played in academy league which was the highest league at the time that you couldn't play high school anymore um, but yes, it's, it, it was super competitive. We've got the FC Dallas Academy here. Who's grown the most homegrown players, um, in the whole country, all, all of MLS. So young talent is not hard to come by. Um, it's just competing against the best of the best, um, here in your local city. What is that? Walk us through for somebody who may not know the sport of soccer all that well, mm-hmm. you know, growing up, you've talked about like uh, FC Dallas Academy and things like that. Mm -hmm. So growing up, you know, I played little league peewees, pony league and baseball, and then Mm -hmm. eventually get into high school travel ball and things like that. were not as big when I was in high school, but growing up playing soccer, what is that like for a kid, especially somebody who does have a high level of talent? Do you have Mm -hmm. to choose between playing like Academy and playing in high school? I mean, ultimately do you have to make that choice as to one or the other? Yeah, absolutely. I think once you get to the high school age, when you're 14, 15, going into freshman year, you have to make that decision. If you you don't make that decision, um, you're playing only local ball rather than regional regional or national. And now there's a league, it's MLS Next. um, And that's the highest league that you can really be in. Um, That as well as a league called ECNL. I can't remember what division off of it. There's so many different leagues now from when I played. But yeah, you have to make that decision because you're not going to be playing against the best talent and the exposure to scouts, you know, recruitment for college or to go sign for your homegrown team. You're just not going to get that opportunity. Yeah, I well, I'd love your opinion on this because, you know, I look at my nephew who's now playing college baseball and he was a, a really talented baseball player here in Wisconsin. And I look at the landscape of high school sports today. And recruiting is so different than it used to be. Do you feel mm-hmm. like for a, a kid growing up in a, a Metroplex like DFW who has aspirations of playing high major college, so D1 college, are they going to most likely have to play on a travel or be in a travel team or be in an academy if they want to have a chance to get recruited at that level? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, as sad as it, it is, just the way the landscape is now, you you've got to not play high school if you're going to play soccer and at a high level. You got to play club, and you got to try to be at the the highest level within the club that you're that you're in, whatever city you're in, um, because they're not going to be there. Um, it doesn't matter if you score a hundred goals; just the level is dropped drastically because of the legislation and, and movement of leagues. Um, that's really where you're going to be able to, to find success or get exposure. Like I said, yeah, no, I, 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 you use the word sad. It is, it's very interesting these days how kids are recruited. And, and I know a lot of young athletes have that struggle because they know they have to go play travel or in an academy in the case of soccer to Mm -hmm. get to the next level, which means they're often leaving the, the comfort of playing with friends, the the kids they grew up with. Right. right? And And I know that's not an easy choice for a lot of, of athletes. So bring me back or bring us back. You know, I remember the, the the night I got the call from the head coach at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and I was offered a scholarship to go pitch there. You know, you went on mm-hmm. to play college soccer at Wake Forest, which is an extremely successful soccer program at the Division One level. What was it like? Do you remember the moment you got the scholarship offer at Wake Forest? I do, um, but it wasn't like one moment where it was a call, you know, like a draft day situation. It was kind of like a slow periodization because I was talking, I was talking to multiple schools and um, with soccer, we only get nine, I think nine or nine and a half scholarships. So it's not like every player is just getting a full ride, right? You can't even feel the starting lineup out on the field with the amount of scholarships um, that soccer gets. So it's also, it was also a numbers game. It's like, all right, can this make sense? All right. If I get 75% here. So kind of working through all that, but I mean, once I had made the decision to go to Wake Forest, I mean, yeah, I was, 
I was super excited. I had the opportunity to go to SMU. I didn't want to go to SMU just because it was local and I didn't think the style or philosophy and, and leadership was quite where I wanted it to be. Um, and so I went to Wake Forest and I knew out of the gate that I wasn't going to be a starter. I was going to have to earn my spot. And that was even more of a challenge that I wanted to push through. I didn't, I didn't choose the easy route, if that makes sense. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful. I think that there's, there's three, three decisions I've made in my life. And, and one of those to go to Wake Forest was, was one of the, one of the best ones I've made. That's uh, I'm glad you brought up the whole scholarship thing. Cause I think people have a distorted perspective on college scholarships they see what goes yeah. on with football and basketball and they don't realize most other sports at a university is literally piecemealing scholarships together you know yeah. giving a half scholarship here a quarter here and a three quarters here because they only get so many scholarships i know i even laugh when i think about playing college baseball the the, the level of uh stipend we got every day for food when we went on the road it people see what happens at division one football and basketball it is not the same with most other sports i can tell you that um talk to me about this i'm curious so off you go east to winston-salem north carolina you're now a demon deacon Mm -hmm. um what was that like because i assume the high school you went to in dallas was fairly good sized and Wake mm-hmm. Forest is actually one of the smallest D1 colleges, I think, in the nation. Yeah. Was that a, a culture shift for you at all? Um, it wasn't. Um, and I would say most the school, the schooling, I mean, school there was was hard. It was really hard. I wasn't I was like an A, B student. I wasn't doing like the best in high school, but I had a good enough grades to get in the school. Um but I would say, I mean, the culture of my club team, I was playing for Solar Academy at the time, to the culture of the soccer program was so similar, like similar standards, similar style. And when you're playing, you know, a sport in college and you know this, you're immersed in that 100 percent. I mean, if you really, really care about it. Right. There's some people that that show up and kind of fall out of the sport and maybe just finish school there. But no, it was so similar. I mean, the school part was the hardest part, but they also give you, you know, academic advisors and tutors and all the resources you need. You just have to put in the time, really. Um, so I wouldn't say it was a culture shock. I would say the weather, <laughs> that was a little different. Um, the, I, I like the cold, but it was really, really cold there. Sometimes you get actually four seasons there. So um, I think that was a huge thing, especially because, you know, in, in club, you play in the fall and the spring, whereas you know, and, and at Wake, we're playing a lot of our season into the cold winter time at the end of the year and the finals are in the end of the year. So um, I think that was more of something to get adapted to at the time of the year that you play. Um, but everything else is pretty similar to what I expected or was used to. Yeah, and for folks listening who are unfamiliar with NCAA soccer, ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference, is legit. And Wake Forest is one of the best programs in the country. And I always feel like if you if you follow the scores in the NCAA tournament for so- men's soccer, there's an ACC team usually going pretty far um, into the tournament. And so talk to me about this because I look at high school sports. A lot of kids can get by on talent alone where they don't have Mm -hmm. to put a lot of work off the field. They just are that talented. And then you get to college and something interesting happens. Everybody's talented. And that's where the men separate themselves from the boys by putting the work in off the field. Did you notice that when you went to Wake Forest, that level of skill get go up where you really had to focus on the work you were putting uh, off the field? Yeah, no, I think, I think you're exactly right. I mean, because the season's so condensed and it's all in the fall. I mean, you've got a lot of time to train, right? You have a spring season. It doesn't really mean anything, but you have a lot of time to get better or to get worse, right? Um, I think for me, going from my high school to college, the one thing that I really noticed was the physicality aspect. The game was faster and, you know, you're playing – I didn't get to play high school much. So when I was playing academy, it was two year age age groups rather than four. Right. So if I'm a freshman and I'm a small guy and I'm playing against a big senior center back. Right. That's 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 a that's a big change. But that wasn't something I was unfamiliar with because I actually grew had a late growth spurt like once I went to college. So I I was small going in and then I grew in my freshman year. so I was always used to being small. So I had to come up with ways to be clever and smart and work around that um, and be able to use my body or use 
them hitting me to give me momentum to, to get to evade them. Right. So, um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. You, the, the work you put in off the field really like in any job, even insurance, right. The work you put in that's, you know, no one's watching and you're not doing it with your team. It, it, it's going to make a difference on the field for sure. I like that you talked about when you're not given the prototypical size, you got to be resourceful. I mean, that resonates with me. I, I was not a prototypical size for a pitcher. I, I went into a TWM at 5'9", 145 pounds, and yeah. I bulked up to 170, but I still was only 5'9", which is not the prototypical size. And so I had to be very athletic on the mound, which is not something pitchers are typically known for. But I also mm-hmm. had to have really good mechanics because I couldn't just get by with throwing 98 miles an hour. And so that really resonates with me with, you know, if you're some, you know, an athlete who doesn't have that size or that specific skill set, you can always overcome it by being resourceful on the field for sure. Mm-hmm. So here's what I love about the game of soccer. I respect the hell out of the fact that a game can go, was it 90 minutes? Mm-hmm. Zero, zero time. And you see the, the, the typical fan watching soccer says, wow, is that boring? All they're doing is passing. Mm-hmm. Somebody freaking shoot. But what yeah. they don't realize is a is a is a constant chess match is going on. Mm-hmm. And I bring this up because I think it was your senior year. You guys actually made it to the national championship, correct? Mm-hmm. And you yeah. lost to Stanford in a shootout after a zero zero tie in regulation. What is it like yeah. to play that long without anybody putting the ball in the net? I mean, it's, it's high stakes. Uh, I think you, br- you bring up a good point. You know, a lot, the two biggest um, things that I hear about soccer is, oh, soccer players are soft. And then, you know, your, your sport is very boring, but it, it's a very intellectual game. So when I hear that, I'm, I, I sometimes like, all right, well, how much are you thinking? Because there's so many nuances, there's so many tactics, there's so many things going on in the game that leads to a goal. And it is very hard to score goals. And so goals are celebrated, you know, immensely because of how hard it is to score a goal. Um, to play in a final, uh, you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That was that game was was one of the most pivotal moments of my life, not to you know, it's college soccer. It's like, Oh, it didn't really mean that much in the moment. It does. Right. But you, I look back on it. It doesn't. But for me, psychologically and mentally, um, I actually had the chance, um, to score the winning PK to win the national championship. And the goalkeeper actually guessed correctly and made an amazing save. And we, we went on to lose a couple PKs later. Um, but that was a, that was a, <laughs> I, I didn't sleep for some time after that. I'll, I'll tell you that I had to go back and take finals and I kept trying to defer my finals um, that semester. And that was the last kick of the ball that I had in college soccer. Um, but what I'll say is after my two weeks of feeling sorry for myself and feeling like I let my team down and, and was a failure, PKs don't define a player. They don't define who you are as a person. And, um, I, uh, I really had to reflect on how I wanted to proceed with my life and I could let that, you know, break me and I never touch a ball again, or I could learn from that and, and face it and watch it over and over and get thicker skin and, and let it be a part of me to, to build forward. Yeah. I think any athlete can, can go back to those pivotal moments like that, especially in such a big game. And I'd say it's probably easier to visualize when you failed at something than when you succeeded. Cause I, when you just said that I got the chills, cause I remember my senior year of high school, we were in the state championship for baseball mm-hmm. and I was playing shortstop and we were up three to two, I believe in the bottom of the sixth of a seventh inning, seven inning game. And we gave up a three run home run to go down and we ultimately lose. I can still picture myself standing at short. I literally just leaned back like this and watched the ball go over my head because I knew it was gone. And I, I can picture that moment like it was yesterday. I bet you you could put yourself right back in that penalty kick, right? Yeah. And you know exactly, you remember that just like it was yesterday. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure anybody listening in, you if you were an athlete, you can remember those moments for sure. Well, you know, you had, you had a very successful college career, Hayden, and that also allowed you to earn a chance to play professionally. And you spent some time in, I think it was the United Soccer League with Sacramento Republic. 
What was that like getting the opportunity to play professional soccer? It was great. Um, it was not. It was not easy getting there. I went on many different trials, but landed in uh, Sac Town. But it, it was awesome because that community embraces that club. I mean, it's just it's a different experience. We had sellout crowds every single game. Um, you could be recognized. You go downtown. You could be recognized. Guys will grab buy you a beer. Um, not saying it's all for the fame, but like to see people have passion and and love the game so much that they're wanting to learn, wanting to connect. It was really cool and it was a really cool experience to to be a part of that. I got really involved with the community. I was I helped mentor coaches with a local um, uh, rec club. Um, I did some other things. Uh, it, it was awesome because we played good style. We played a good style. We made playoffs every year, went on to a conference semifinal. Um, and yeah, I just really grew as a person um, because I had a lot of time off the field. It wasn't like I was doing school and and uh, playing. Um, I was playing and then trying to figure out, hey, what do I want to do after school or after soccer? Or do I just want to com communicate with it, com uh, get connected with the community and and kind of learn about other things that people got going on? Yeah, I like that. No, we're going to get into your insurance career here in a minute. But, uh, you know, I love when I get a chance to talk to athletes who've gone on to play at a very high level, especially college or or and or even pro. We're going to have a little fun, though, with soccer, because I know there's a lot of people who don't quite understand the game. So I'm going to ask you some questions. You ready to have a little fun? Yeah. So it. you're a midfielder, which means mm -hmm. you are all over the place in a typical soccer game. How many miles would you run? Around eight, eight miles. <laughs> And that, that yes. includes, you know, you're practicing five, six days a week, couple games a week where you're running eight miles a week. I just remember at UWM, we had a good men's soccer team as well. And we would see those guys in the weight room and their quads were just because you guys are running so many miles. Okay. What is the difference between a red card and a yellow card? Okay. So a red card. I mean, it's it could be something off the ball, like a guy punching someone. It could be a guy throwing an elbow, going up for a header. Um, it's really a dangerous play. Or if you're the last player on the like the last defender, say a guy he he got a last touch and he's in basically one v one with a goalie. If a guy does a standard foul and takes that person out, it's a goal scoring opportunity. So that's a red card. Um, a yellow card is just a stern challenge or consecutive challenges over time. So um, if I do two or three fouls, uh, uh, you know, in a certain amount of time or in the first half, um, it's kind of up to there's, there's laws, but the re it's up to the ref's discretion. Right. If I'm just being, you know, a guy kicked me and they didn't call the foul and I'm like retaliating and pissed off about it and go kicking people around, you know, they'll, they'll settle it down with a yellow card. Um, but if you get two yellow cards, it's, it's, it's a red card as well. Yeah. Um, got it. And okay. then your team has to play a man down. So it's not, it's not fun. It's not like hockey. A little like hockey. Or, yeah. A little yeah, like hockey though. Like you got to play man down. Okay. Yeah. The whole time, the whole game though. And you have to sit out depending on the severity of the, of the, red card or how you got the red card, you could have some game suspension thereafter as well. Oh, I didn't realize that when a guy got ejected, you the, the team's playing a man down the whole time. Wow. Hi, it's Andy Neary, and thank you for listening to the Bullpen Sessions podcast. Did you know the ideas shared on this show are things we actually specialize in helping you implement? If you're an insurance professional and you want to turn your credibility into consistent client acquisition, Visit CompleteGameConsulting.com and schedule a free strategy call. Again, that's CompleteGameConsulting.com to request your free strategy call. All right, let's jump back into today's podcast episode. Yeah. Um, okay, when I watch professional soccer, like European soccer, and a guy is getting mm -hmm. subbed in, they hold up a sign with a number. What the heck does that mean? They're they're just they're just putting the red number is the number of the player that's coming off, and the green number is the number that the player is going on. And then the other, only okay. other time, only other time they use a number is if there's doing injury time. So if one team's up, they'll be like wasting time. They'll be going to get in their throws really slow. Well, the ref has two watches. He'll he'll add time. And so once it hits ninety minutes, it could be 
90 plus eight. And what they'll do is they'll notify the, the crowd of what injury time was determined. And so that's a minimum as well, because then you could have a team that's wasting time in injury time. And so the ref will add on um, to that as well. Got it. OK, last question. Is 2024 a World Cup year? No, it's not. It's okay, not. I, it I think it's okay. 26 that the World Cup is here. In US, it's in the United States, Mexico, isn't it? OK. And Canada. Yeah. OK. OK. So let's move into your insurance career. I'm inter- I'm curious to know, because almost none of us got into this industry by design. <laughs> you started. But actually, before you got to McGriff, you started with New York Life. What right. uh, what led you to make that decision to jump into? Let's just call it the insurance financial planning industry. Yeah. Um, so COVID happened and I was playing in the USL championship, which is the second division and uh, player rights were all over the place at this point. Um, we were trying to do a collective bargaining agreement. COVID hit. Um, I, as a, as a four year, I was in my going into my fifth season for 2021. I just, I couldn't make a, a good living to, you know, be stable with a family. So I looked at all these other jobs I interviewed and I was living in San Antonio at the time. Um, and I interviewed with New York life and I went through the interview process with them and I selfishly, it piqued my interest because I learned about some things in the interview process that I wasn't doing with money. And I was like, wow, I, I selfishly want to learn this, not get gain this knowledge to then share with others. And so that's why I took the job. Um, so I, I worked there. I, I got all my series exams. So I was taking CHFC designation uh, designation. And I, my goal was to become a CFP. That was my goal uh, uh, initially. And so um, doing personal insurance. So on the ancillary side, I have really good you know, background because I understood that. Um, and then securities, investments, things like that, retirement. Um, well, there was a guy that uh, works at McGriff. That, and this goes back to relationships. He, he actually grew up with my father. Um, he saw one time, I guess, on LinkedIn that he's like, oh, Hayden's in insurance. So my first week or second week that I was working at New York Life, he has a large client in San Antonio. He came into town and he he hit me up and was like, hey, let's go to lunch. And I met him and he walked me through the group space, like what they do, what it's like. And I told him, and I felt like he was trying to recruit me, but I was also like, I'm so new. I don't know what I don't know. I just started this and I'm not a quitter. I need to figure out what I want to do. And right now I like this. So I'm going to keep at this and let's just stay in touch. And if my mind, if I change my mind or something happens, you know, I'll, I'll reach out. And so that's kind of what happened. I started, doing re- really well in New York life, but then just, I had a kid <laughs> and the way that you get paid in New York life is your straight commission only. And so I had, I had many, um, deals fall through that were like make or break. And I was like, I can't do this. I'm doing everything right. Um, from, from a business standpoint and things aren't, aren't closing and it's okay. That's timing. And it's w- whatever it may be There's many different reasons. Um, I was like, I need to explore this opportunity that I was known about or let known about a while ago. So I reached back out, went through the interview process. It was something that I was interested in um, and I kind of uh, explored it. And then, yeah, you know, here here we are. No, that's uh, awesome because I love hearing the stories of how people get in because I think everybody's got a unique story. Some sound similar to the others, but what what is very common is you don't hear somebody say, well, I actually went to college and I had every goal to get in the insurance industry. So I got my degree in insurance, said very few people ever. And right. so most of us find a way because somebody recommended it to us. Mm-hmm. And okay, so you actually did end up making the shift over the benefits. Right. And here you are today with McGriff and DFW as an employee benefit consultant. You have been with McGriff a little over a year as of this recording. What are some early lessons you've learned by spending your first year in the uh, benefit space? Um, the sales cycle is a lot slower than personal lines. I'll tell you that. Um, but I'll say, I mean, there are some smart people in this industry, super savvy no, you know, a lot of people that come from the carrier side and then now are brokers. So they got underwriting experience, but I'll tell you, there's, there's a few things that I've really noticed and 
the first thing is there's a lot of people that are like trailblazers, if you want to call them, that are trying to change the landscape, which I'm all for. I, I, I was innovative in my style of playing. I, I loved trying to, you know, give feedback to the coaches so we could, you know, change strategic approaches to the way we played. So I'm all for that. Um, the thing I've noticed, though, in, in trying to adopt some of those strategies is the marketplace is less receptive of that than than I would think. Right. And everyone wants to save money. That's the that's the biggest thing. Right. Everyone wanna, wants to save money and they want to have the newest improved plan. You know, wellness plans are a hot topic right now. You know, all the uh, specialty drugs, all of that is, is, is a hot topic as well. Um, but there's all these great ideas, but when I go to speak to people about them, they, they just see it as more work for them. It might save them money, but they might have to hire more staff to, to be able to, you know, uh, maintain or adopt that. Um, all these, all, there's many different variations, but that's something I've noticed. The other thing I've noticed is, um, people, their service is just not as good as what you would think it is. And I, I go to social media. I know you're you're active on social media, which is great from a branding standpoint. But for me, the follow through is the only reason that I've won business early on. And it's because people, they, they really just, they say one thing, but they don't follow through with, with it. Right. And it's easy as, you know, picking up the phone and putting out a fire for someone or responding to an email or just addressing something and saying, hey, I can't get to this at the moment, but we are working on it in the back and we will update you. Like little simple stuff like that, I think go a long way. And for me, having like white glove service as a broker, as, as if I'm, you know, an account manager, I, I want my people to feel that, right? I want them to feel like they're the most important. So I really, uh, for me, there's a lot of people say it all the time, um, you know, oh, brokers are just out on the golf course. They close a the business and they're on the golf course. I, I'm not like that, but I'm happy there are other people like that because <laughs> opportunity to, to sneak in and just, you know, actually do the business. Um, so that's that's a few ob observations um, that I've had in a short amount of time. I'm obviously still learning the technical side, yeah. still drinking water from a fire hose. I'm not, I'm not going to say I, I can sit here and know everything. I know, I know a lot more than I did a year ago, but I also know, um, where the people are to solve a certain situation or, or, uh, or category that I don't know as much. I think that's important. You just said that because I think a lot of people in our industry think they have to be the jack of all trades and the keeper of all mm -hmm. knowledge. But knowing that, no, I don't know everything and that's okay, but I have access to the people who do is very important. You also talk about service. It is very important. Not only do you set an expectation, you actually meet said expectation. I think a lot of people do say the right things to win business, but they don't back up those words with action. So you, so your your point is very well taken. And, and one more thing about the whole innovation thing. You know, I, I always think in terms of sports. And I can remember when there was a time in college football, Hayden, I don't know how much you follow college football, but when Chip Kelly was at Oregon and he had this offense that nobody knew how to figure out. It was called the uh, RPO, right? The, the run pass option thing. And nobody could figure this out. Nobody was doing it. People scoffed at it. Mm -hmm. Well, check out college football today. Everybody runs it. And yeah. things will evolve and things will innovate. And I tell the advisors, I say that for the advisors out there who are trying to talk about these outside the box ideas, these innovative mm -hmm. ideas, keep pushing, keep pushing, yeah. keep pushing. I know it's frustrated because mm -hmm. these employers don't want to do it right now, but things are going to change. And eventually yeah. this is going to become the industry norm. So just keep pushing. I'm curious because at your age, Hayden, you're still young to the industry. You have grown up in a generation that has known social media its whole life. Mm-hmm. Our industry has not, right? Our industry on average is still 55, 60 years old. What do you think or how do you think social media plays an important part of your prospecting and business development, if at all? Yeah, I think I think it's extremely important. I think from a branding standpoint, you know, people need to know and have the front of mind what you do, how who you are as a person. And social media does just that. And the cool thing about it, too, is, you know, you go if I were to meet you, you know, for a drink in person, right. As time goes on, 
we could forget, you know, little details about that encounter. Whereas social media, it's on there forever. So you do one post that maybe piques someone's interest. Well, you, you could be getting likes two years later, right? You could be getting calls two years later. So I think, I think it's really important. I, I do think that there should be other variations to it. I think all the clients that I have gotten, there's a huge piece of in-person in that. Um, so I think there should be variation in the way you market yourself, but no, I think you have to dabble in it and, and, and it needs to be consistently. I'll be honest. I, I did really well. I felt like once I first started when I had no clients and then I got, I started having clients and I wanted to give that service that I was talking to you about. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out a way to balance all that, but you know, I, I told you last time we did this was I had four categories. I've got prospecting, service, systems, and education. Those are the four categories that I like to focus on and dabble in each and every day so that I can continue to progress forward. But if you're not online, if you're not on LinkedIn or anywhere, social media, um, you need to, you need to start. What are those four again? Prospecting, servicing, servicing. systems. Yep systems and education. That's so really good. And you, you try to hit all four of those buckets every day. I tr yeah. That's the goal. When now you say education, is it, is it self-education or educating your prospects? It, um, self-education. I like that. Um, I would say educating my prospects is uh, probably prospect prospect activity education yep. for myself. Because I mean, even when I do, you know, know as much as other brokers, like you said, the, the landscape is changing. So we've yep. got to continue to evolve with that. And when I said earlier that there's not as much adoption about of all these innovative ways, doesn't mean you shouldn't know about it as a consultant and shouldn't mm -hmm. be presenting it. You should be presenting everything, right? Based on what they've told you or the questions you've asked, you, you should be presenting the options that you think are are the best. Now, if they take it or not, you know, that's up to them. But I, I always have to be up to date on that, especially, you know, with legislation, compliance, all these other things. There's so many different things that you got to be in the know. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. Um, I hope everybody heard what you just said. Prospecting, servicing systems and education every day. If you that that number four is what really, really spoke to me, because what you're talking about, Hayden, is is what made you successful in soccer. It's the work you're putting off the field. Self-education, mm -hmm. professional development, that can't go overlooked. I think there's a lot of people in our industry who hit a point of success and they feel like they've made it. And mm -hmm. then they stop, they stop their professional development growth. And I think that's so important that every day you find time in your calendar to, to, to continue your education, whether it's learning more tactical skills and insurance or just mm -hmm. mindset. Uh, habits, skills, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think that is so, so important. Um, I'm curious, man, we're, we're starting to wrap up the show here. You're not only uh, a benefits advisor, you're also a color, color analyst for the Dallas Sidekicks, which is an indoor soccer, professional indoor soccer team in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, so now you're selling insurance. You're a color analyst for the Sidekick. You're a father, a husband. Mm -hmm. How do you balance your time, man? <laughs> You got to have a rigid calendar. If it's not on the calendar, it's not happening. Um, I, I don't know. I've always just liked being involved in different things. And the cool thing about all the things I'm involved in is they build off of each other. Like I'm in the community. I'm commentating with with uh, the sidekicks. I commentated in the league that I played pro in, you know, two years previously. So that helped me get this opportunity. Um, but you know, I meet people because of that. I've had I've had insurance meetings because of it. Um, so it, it all works together. You know, I think prospecting in the way that you go about your daily life, like whether it be the grocery store, right? It doesn't matter. Just have conversation with people. But I would say, yeah, just extremely disciplined in the way that you build your calendar and then staying true to it. I know that when I was at New York Life, you you ran your own business. I learned a lot of lessons then. Um, and it was, I would make my calendar, I would do it and then I would change it and I would try to like restructure and I kept restructuring, restructuring. And it's like, no, no. At, at some point you've got to stick to it, see over a long period of time, see if it's successful or not, and then you can modify it accordingly. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's important to to me to be around the game still and it's important to me to to bring good ideas to my clients and also just make a living to help take care of my family 
it's also built your brand, and which is like what I love is being a color analyst. To your point, has led to business opportunities on the insurance side. Mm-hmm. And the point is, your story is your brand. And and the more people get to know you, the more they feel like they trust you, and that makes it easier for them to reach out and potentially do business with you. Now, your story just happens to include a part of you that's very public color analyst mm-hmm. for a professional soccer team. But the point is, if you just let that be part of your brand. Mm-hmm. Like I, I know there are insurance professionals out there, Hayden, that would say, oh, Hayden, you don't want people to know you're a color analyst because it might take away from your credibility as an insurance advisor. It's like, no, it enhances my credibility as an insurance advisor. So yeah. I love that. Now, I am curious. I do have a question being a, a content junkie. Have you noticed, has being a color analyst, so you are literally talking us through a soccer game play by play, mm-hmm. right? in real time, has that had an impact in how you present insurance in the boardroom? For sure. I think the biggest thing is being adaptable and, and being able to pivot mid conversation. Um, the heart, I, I still today, I mean, I've probably called, I don't even know how many games I've probably called 80 to a hundred games maybe now. Um, so and every time, because there's cameras, because there's a microphone, I get nervous every time. But the reason I did it the first time was because it was an opportunity that I got when I stopped playing. Um, and I knew it was an area that I was going to be scared to do. Like, I was, it was going to make me uncomfortable. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go and do this. Whatever skill set that comes from this, great. But I'm just going to show up because I love the game and I think I have a good brain and insight on telling what they want on the on the on the air. Um, but I would say, yeah, being adaptable and pivoting like like quickly that that has helped me drastically because you could be having a conversation with someone about one specific topic and then they could. I know I have some, some clients that like, they just, they throw like, they got like eight trains going at the same time and you're just trying to jump on one of them. And so I feel like I can consolidate and compartmentalize that and actually speak to something rather than just being completely overwhelmed and discombobulated by the situation. I like that. That's the adaptability for sure. As you're televising a game is so important. Okay. Last two questions and I'll let you roll, man. Um, You've been in the industry for 13, 14 months, the benefits industry specifically. Mm -hmm. If somebody's listening in who is thinking about getting in the insurance industry or just Mm -hmm. like you has just started their career, what advice would you give them? I would say wherever you start, make sure that you have at least one person that's willing to go to war for you. And not just not just like bail you out so you don't get fired, but like someone that will invest time in trying to teach you things, um, will answer your questions. Um, I, I'm very fortunate; I have three of those, but they're all they all have big books, so they don't have a lot of time for me, right? So um, that's the first thing. So I, I go to them when when I can get any of them. Um, the second thing is you got to be able to do things that other people don't want to do. You got to be able to grind hard in the morning. You got to be able to grind hard at night. The beginning of it is the hardest part. Um, I, it's, I would say it is to some degree a front loaded career, right? Not for me, because like I said, I want to continue to evolve and learn and adapt and not be like some others that I've run into, um, that are kind of just steady Eddie kind of hanging out now. Um, and then I would say the company that you're working with, make sure that, you know, you agree with their philosophy. I know there's a, there's a lot of companies that, you know, cold calling is the only thing. I'm not saying don't do cold calling, but that's something one small portion that I do. Right. I They give me the leeway to go out in the community, be a part of, of groups and take time to build relationships over a long period of time. And I agree with their philosophy. If I didn't, it would be really hard for me to buy in. Um, so I would say those three things are important to be successful. That's awesome advice, man. I hope you, if you're listening in, you're, you've been in the industry for a couple of years, take note of what he just said. That's vitally important. Now, I'm going to flip it on you for a second. You probably didn't expect this one. If I have a veteran listening who might be going, okay, I'm here and I'm listening to this young buck, new wet behind the ears to the end of three. What advice would you give somebody who's been doing this for 25 years? I would say evaluate, you know, 
the way that you do your business. Now, if you're 25 years into the industry, I mean, you're probably getting a lot of business from referrals, right? Could there be something or a way that you could te- pass on your teachings to someone like, like myself, right? Mm-hmm. That might provide value to you and your company. Um, or could you try finding new business a different way? I don't know, challenge, challenge you to do that. Um, there are there are many different ways to get business. We all know that, but I know for guys that I know they're 25 um, years into this, they, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. They're super knowledgeable. They might not, you know, really adopt these new innovative ways. So learning about that, you know, bringing it to the marketplace and then, yeah, see if you can shed light on someone on with someone else that's young, like myself. And there, there's many times that I've gone after business with, veterans and I brought them in the door and then they, we used their brain, you know, to, to kind of come up with solutions. So we kind of tag team it. We learned something from each other. No, that's great advice. I, I think it's imperative for somebody who's been in the industry for a while. Somebody mentored them. There's somebody early in your career who lifted you up. And when you hit a certain point in your career where you're having success, I think it's an obligation to return the favor and mentor others. That's, that's great advice. Mm-hmm. All right. Hayden, this has been a pleasure, man. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy. If somebody wanted to reach out and connect with you, what would be the easiest way to do it? My cell phone or my email. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well, but I get many <laughs> hundreds of vendor messages on LinkedIn. So I, I of course. Will be honest, I'm not as good at uh, responding on there, but my cell phone, call text, email. I will get back to you as soon as possible. All right. Well, I appreciate this, man. This is, I love your story and I love your discipline and your drives, why you're successful so early in your insurance career for you listening in. Uh, I hope you took a lot of notes today because what Hayden had to say is true. Um, talent is important, but it's the work you put off in off the field when nobody is watching And that constant desire for growth is where you are going to achieve consistent success because you know what happens when you mix clarity with confidence, you will be consistent. And then your only job at that point is to be persistent and be patient. Be good. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's podcast episode. Remember, if you found value in this episode, do me a favor, give it a like, share it, post about it, go subscribe to make sure you get every episode from us every single week. And my only ask from you is that if you have anybody in your life, whether it be a teammate, a peer, family member, or a friend, please share this podcast with them. That's how we grow. We only grow through word of mouth. And I would be forever grateful if you take the time to do that. All right. Now, It's time for you to take what you learned and it's time for you to go out and share your message with the world. Execution, clarity, and consistency is everything. Be well.